Okay? Let me get my notes out. So, you know, next week is Father's Day, and I'm not going to preach about Father's Day today, but I had a couple conversations this week about fathers. You know, I was very lucky to have a good father. I wish he would have taught me more about spiritual things than he taught me about things here on earth. But nonetheless, he was a very good father that I looked up to and everything else. But, you know, there's that time when we seek to rebel. We want our own ways, everything else. We don't realize that good fathers have the best intentions for us. And talking this week with a couple different individuals and seeing that, it came up in conversation that it was hard to relate to God as a father because that image was distorted. You know, God is love. The creator of all things. We can look at creation out there and it screams design. It screams that there is a purpose in life. You've got to figure out what that purpose is. And then to know that the sovereign being who created all of this loves you enough that he would become flesh and blood. He would send his only son to die for you to teach you how to live, to save you from what you cannot save yourself for, and then to turn you into the very image of Christ, which is the very image of God, and that He comes to live with us, where by His Spirit we can cry out, Father. That love is just overwhelming, whether you understand a good father or not. That it's all about that relationship that we have with the Almighty that we can cry out Father to Him and that He loves us regardless of whether we comprehend that or not. And that Jesus said that no greater love does a man have but to lay down his life for his friends. That's what God has done for us. And He hasn't orphaned us. He lives with us, sanctifying us by His truth, turning us into children of love. It's hard to love though, isn't it? Love's a choice. It's not a funny feeling, even though the world says it is a funny feeling. And I love because I feel this way you make me feel loved. Love is a choice that you choose to love even the unlovable and that you have compassion for them. Do you have that in your heart? You should if you have the love of God in your heart. Scripture says, how can you love your fellow man? If you don't love God, and God is love. So think about this for a minute. Have you ever felt alone? (laughs) Have you ever felt less than? Have you ever felt that life is just too much to handle sometimes? And wish somebody cared? And maybe there was somebody in this world that cared. Maybe there wasn't. Maybe you had an image of a good father. Maybe you didn't. But God is love, and God so loved the world that He gave His one and only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him will not perish, but have everlasting life. And then as we read Scriptures, we understand that that life is not just for eternity. Jesus died and rose again and stayed here and taught about the kingdom of heaven so we would understand that, so that we would live like children of the kingdom of heaven. And that we have the power, Him living inside of us. That's why I stress the fact that the Holy Spirit is not just a power. It is a person of the Godhead as best as we can understand the person of of God. And He lives inside of each and every one of us. And He wants us to be like Him. To be children of love. And if you don't believe this isn't a hurting world right now with corona and with all the other things going on and all the pressures of this world where the devil is constantly saying there's another way to find your happiness, your purpose, and everything else, then I guess we're just a little too isolated in Bonner's Ferry because the world is hurting and it needs a Savior. And Jesus Christ will return. But when He returns... We won't be His hands and feet then anymore. We won't have the time to love others so that they see Christ's love in us. When Jesus Christ returns, there will be judgment. 
But thank goodness we live in the age now where we are the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. We can show that love to others so that they see our good works, the things that we've done for them because we have compassion and love, and it glorifies our Father in heaven. And guess what? God can save them without us doing that also, but He calls us to be a part of it so that we will grow to be more and more like Him, that the Spirit will transform us through and through, sanctify us tr through and through. Wouldn't it be nice if we got to walk with Jesus? We do walk with Jesus each and every day. That's why He said He would not forsake us. And that's why He said He would send another comforter. He is right here. That means God is right here, dwelling and living with you. All because of His love for you, which is unfathomable. I cannot even comprehend it, that, that all of this creation, which is so complex, so beautiful, everything else, even in its fall, we live in a, cre in a fallen creation, that God would choose to love us, you, I, so much that He would send His one and only Son to die for us so that we might live, not just exist, but live as children of love. John 14, 1. Jesus said, Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. And then he goes on to talk about the Holy Spirit. John chapters 14, 15, and 16 are where he's talking to his disciples, those closest to him, because he is going to passionately lay down his life for them, and they're not going to understand it. Their comprehension is that Jesus, the Messiah, the chosen one of God, would come and save people, yes, but in their minds that means save you from the persecutions and trials and troubles of this world. But yet Jesus calls you as a Christian to suffer for the kingdom because all of this suffering that you would face on this world because you are a child of light, you are a child of love, that the things that you face in this world don't matter one bit to your eternal security and the love that is lavished upon you that you could be called a child of God. And he talks about the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, and he prays to the Father that we'll be one in mind, one in, in power by the Spirit because of the mission that we have to carry out. And if you throw chapter 13 in there, which is fine too, he shows us how to do it because he humbles himself and washes his servants' feet. And then we have the establishment of this new covenant written in the blood of Jesus Christ and nothing can ever separate us from God because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. So in chapter 14, he says, Do not let your hearts be troubled. I don't know what troubles your heart's feeling right now, but even as a Christian, you have troubles. You have doubts. You have insecurities. You say, Why me, Lord? And we want every tear to be wiped now, but I'm going to tell you, every tear will be wiped, but not necessarily now. And Jesus said, If they persecute me, they will persecute you. But will you give up your life to follow Jesus? Will you deny yourself? Will you take up a cross, an instrument of humiliation, suffering, and death to follow after Jesus, the one who gives you life? And you can't have life without love. You have been given a spirit of love. All the songs that Debbie picked out were wonderful. But are you a child of love? Do you live those songs in your life because the Spirit guides you and directs you in all truth? Reminds you of Jesus because the Spirit is Jesus living in and through you if you let the Spirit do that. Sure, you might believe as God is Creator. Sure, you might believe that Jesus came to save this world, that He was a real person, that He died and rose again and, and prepared a place for you, is preparing a place for you. But do you truly believe that the Spirit of God is in you and wants to live through you, guiding it, you into all truth? Because if you are, you are a new creation in Christ. That's what Scripture says. And as we get to, and we will get to it, what happened in the church, the first church, clearly the first thing that happens is there's, there's gifts of the Spirit, 
to tell people about Jesus Christ, but then there's a change in each of those individuals. They don't live their lives for themselves anymore. They even sell their property and everything so that they can share everything with those that have needs so that they don't have to worry about being tied down with the idols and the things of this world, but instead live freely for the kingdom of God because that's what matters. Because God loves us and we should love others. John's gospel is written so that we might believe. But you know, it says more than that. So I'm going to skip to John 20, verse 31. I'm going to go to the end, then I'm going to go back to the beginning of John. This son of thunder who wanted to rain down fire and destroy people, but then writes all this about love, 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 and how you will love. I think Jesus said that in, in, in John where he said that that we would be known by our love. And that's not just for the church body, but that's even more for the church body, but for everyone in this world. Because it's God's will that no one perish, but everyone come to Him. In John 20, verse 31, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of His disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these, these signs are written that you may believe. Believe what? That Jesus is the Messiah, the chosen one. And we went over that earlier this year, what that meant to people about the Messiah, whether they were right or wrong about it. But the Messiah would be the one that would save you. We also read in Scripture last week that you're saved from the wickedness of this world. Not just saved from the penalty of your sin, but the power of your sin. So that you can live that as that new creation in life. Verse 31, But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is Messiah, the Son of God, and, so not just that you believe, that by, by believing you may have life in His name. Read Scripture. Not just eternal life, abundant life. Life to live in freedom to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow after Jesus. All the things that you live for, all the things that mean something to you, would you throw them all away if you knew for sure that you would save your family? Would you take however long that it took to build an ark to save your family? Would you love unconditionally because God loved you unconditionally? Would you not judge but let God be in control of that? Would you not worry about answering back when somebody's wronged you because Christ was silent before His accusers because He wanted to give up His life to save us so that we could have life. And not just life, but abundant life. So what does this new life in Christ look like? Does your life look like this? Does it look like Jesus Christ who would lay down His life to save His friends? No greater love is there than that. Life that we cannot know. We can chase after everything under the sun, every created thing, and never find satisfaction, never find truth, never find love. Because God is truth. God is love. No one comes to the Father except through Jesus Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life. You find that in this, in this passage of John and in this conversation that he's going to the cross to die for them. And you don't find it unless you're born again, born by the Spirit of God, because the Spirit is what comes and convicts man of their sins and convicts us to righteousness, to live a holy life, to give up the way that we lived before. But why? So that we can live for him, for the kingdom. So I want to do a brief review a little bit of, of John to get us to this part of the Holy Spirit to see the, the, the importance and why Jesus would say, I've got to go so that the Spirit can come and be in you and live through you. And greater things you will do because the Spirit of God lives in you. 
So going back to the beginning in John chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life. And that life was the light of all mankind. Do you see God and Jesus in the Spirit here? The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And you're supposed to shine your light before men because you are a child of light. You're supposed to love even your enemies because Christ loved even his enemies. That's why he gives the examples that he gives and says, If a man take, wants your coat, give him your shirt also. Make him question, why would you do this? Or her, whatever it is, whoever it is. Why would you love this way? And then that gives you the opportunity because God loves me so much that He sent His one and only Son to die for me. It's all about relationships. That's why we seek it so much. That's why Father's Day to some means the world and to others it means terrible things because they don't know how to fathom a father. And it's not by coincidence, like I said, that I talked to a couple gentlemen this week that did not know how to fathom father till the Holy Spirit came upon them and showed them God's love as a father. That we could cry out, Dad. Because we can understand that relationship now. We can understand the love that we've never been able to comprehend because God loves us so much that He would do these things. And He will never forsake us. And He lives with us right now inside of us, changing us through and through, like a caterpillar to a butterfly, so that we may present our bodies as a living sacrifice, that we can sacrifice the things that used to mean something because, as Paul says, they're all rubbish and garbage compared to knowing God because God is love. There is no relationship without Jesus Christ. There is no hope. There is no light. There is no comfort. There is no life. No life on this world. You'll seek for it and never find it without Jesus. And then no eternal life because you'll die in your sins. Plain and simple. John the Baptist is introduced, and we read some from last week from the other three Gospels that he taught repentance to change your mind, to change the way you think about things. Because you were created in God's image for God's glory to worship Him, to thank Him, to give Him praise, to live a life that glorified Him. And the rest of this is icing on that cake because He loves you so much that there is beauty out here. There are the things that you enjoy, but don't put your hope in created things. Put your praise and your worship in the Creator. But he teaches repentance, and even the Pharisees come to him. But he says, you brood of vipers. The tax collectors come to him, and the soldiers come to him, and he tells them what to do. And he tells them to live a life that proves that they've repented. And if they believe this, they'll follow in John's baptism. But John says he is not the Messiah because they ask him and question him because they're searching and looking for that relationship and for that person that will save them from all the things in this world they need saving from, whatever they are. But John says that he's not the Messiah. One greater would come and that he would baptize with the Holy Spirit. Have you been born from above? John chapter 2 talks about the wedding at Cana. At Cana, excuse me. And how the party ran out of wine. The celebration was over. It wasn't yet Jesus' time, he told his mother. But it was his time to teach us, and that's why John recorded this sign first, that there's every reason to celebrate. Just because you think the wine has run out, it has not. There is a call for celebration because Jesus is the one that can change water into wine. If only you'll believe, if only you'll take the steps that you need to take by faith for that water to turn into wine. There is a reason to celebrate. 
And then in John chapter 3, we have this conversation with a Pharisee, one who should know all about scriptures, who should be a teacher. But he comes to Jesus in the dark rather than in the light because he doesn't want his deeds exposed. He believes in God, but not enough to forsake everything and follow after him. But by reading it, it looks like he finally does. In John chapter 3, just to skim a few verses here, Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night. Verse 5, Jesus replied to him, Very, very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of heaven unless they are born of water and of spirit. Flesh gives birth to the flesh, but spirit gives birth to the spirit. New life, because God's spirit has come into you. Verse 13, no one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him so that we could live for Him, that we could be His hands and feet, that we could be children of love, children of light, carrying the truth, shining in the darkness. Verse 18, Whoever believes in Him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stand condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come in the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly what they have done has been done in the sight of God. How are you living your life? Does the world plainly see God's love flowing from you? John testifies that Jesus is the one that the world is crying out for. In verse 34, he, said, he writes, For the one whom God has sent speaks the word of God, for God gives the Spirit without limit. The Father loves the Son and has placed everything in His hand. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. But whoever rejects the Son will not see life, because for God's wrath remains on him. The triune, triune work of God as Creator, and because of the Spirit, we know Him as Father. Because of the Son and His sacrifice, and He walked here on this earth, gave up His life for us, the Spirit lives inside of us now since He went, and we get to have Jesus revealed to us who is God the Father. Wow! Wow! All of this is in your life as you submit to the Holy Spirit. I'd hate to be one that just barely escaped the fire. I want to live my life for God. I cannot do it without the power of the Spirit. The same Spirit that guided and directed Jesus through His walk as a man on this earth. The same power of God that hovered over the waters in creation. The same powers of God that rose Jesus from the dead. The same power of God that Jesus promised that came mightily upon men at Pentecost and the church exploded. The same power that we need to live our lives now and that the church needs to explode the church again. Nothing has changed there. In chapter 4, there's a scandalous woman at the well, and we're going to get back to that in a minute, who needs someone to tell her about all these things that she's hurting about. And just to briefly go there, Jesus was the one, but His disciples maybe missed the opportunity. I know that they didn't even recognize her as being worthy. I say I know, I feel that way. I don't want to put I, I know as facts on Scripture. Because when they came back, they were like, I can't believe Jesus is talking to that woman. 
In John chapter 5, Jesus talks about life again, and he mentions life five more times. In John chapter 6, Jesus talks about and mentions life 11 more times, and he says a statement here that is just profound, I am the bread of life. Verse 57 of chapter 6, Just as the living Father sent me, I live because of the Father. So the one who feeds on me will live because of me. Verse 63, The Spirit gives life, the flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of spirit and life. Yet there are some of you who do not believe, for Jesus had made known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. In chapter 8, verse 12, when Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but have the light of life. In chapter 10, the thief comes only to steal, kill, kill, and destroy. I have come that you may have life and have it to the full. Verse 27, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. A life that you can't have now, an eternal life which you cannot have, unless the Spirit of God resides in you because you are born again. And like I said, you might have fire insurance because that happens. But you're called to live for God. To be a new creation in Jesus Christ. Then we get to John chapter 11, where man dies, a beloved man, a man who seems to have done good things, but once you're dead and gone, your life is over, is it not? Unless you're given a second chance, <laughs> and all of us have been given a second chance to live this life if we have believed in Jesus Christ. Lazarus dies, and we read in verse 23, Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise soon. And Martha answered, I know he will rise again at the resurrection in the last day. But Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Now, yes, he's talking about eternal life, but you should see from Scripture here that he's talking about abundant life for you to live now. The one who believes in me will live even though they die, and whoever lives by believing in me will never die. You will live a life that brings glory and honor to God now, and you will live for all eternity doing that forever, praising God. Do you believe this? And then at the beginning of John chapter 12, we see Lazarus giving his testimony. And what does it cost him? Well, the Pharisees and Sadducees and the other religious leaders say, we need to kill Lazarus also, don't we? Because if we don't, everybody will be coming to Jesus. Wait a minute. We've got somebody giving his testimony of the new life that he's been given because of Jesus. But yet the world wants to kill him for it. And then in verse 23 of chapter 12, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. How? By giving up his life. Very truly I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. We're supposed to follow after Jesus, lay down our lives so we can save others. Verse 25, anyone who loves their life, they will lose it. While anyone who hates their life in this world, they will keep it for eternal life. A laying down of your life now for the kingdom, which you can't do on your own, but you definitely can do through the power of the Spirit who will transform you and sanctify you through and through. And you will keep your life for all of eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am my servant will also be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. Now my soul is troubled. Got that word trouble. I started out with trouble where Jesus told us not to be troubled. But as a man, he is troubled even to his soul. <clears throat> Something, that, again, that we can debate and talk about, but it's our very essence of life. And he's troubled to his soul and says, Well, what shall I do then because of this trouble? Father, save me from this hour? Is that what I should say? No. It was for this very reason that I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. 
Whatever trouble you're facing in this world, there is nothing wrong with praying that that thorn in the flesh might be taken away, but God's answer might be no. Because you don't know the comp... The, you don't have the comprehension to understand everything. And God works His purpose and He's working it through you. There's beauty that comes from ashes. I believe that's a saying, correct? The love that God has for us is worth more than anything that we can suffer for in this world. And there is no reason for us to be troubled. Jesus tells of His coming passion, His death, even their betrayal of Him, Judas's and Peter's. And then in chapter 14, He says, Do not let your hearts be troubled. There is no reason for it, even in this world. Because Jesus has defeated Satan's the power of death in your life and the penalty of death in your life. He has no dominion and authority in your lives. You serve a new king. Behold, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Do you belong to the kingdom of heaven? So I'm going to jump back to chapter 4 for a minute. And that, I'm going to close there, but not yet. <laughs> Let's look at this woman. Now he, Jesus, had to go, through, go to, through Samaria. And as you study, you'll know that he didn't have to go through Samaria. In fact, the, the people avoided Samaria because they didn't like those half-breeds. Those had, who didn't know how to worship correctly. But we don't know how to worship correctly either if we have that view of someone, do we? <laughs> but he had to go through there because there was a woman there who needed him. Maybe she was saying, this is the last time I can't deal with it. I don't know. I'm not going to read that into Scripture, but I'm going to throw some questions out there. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob was given to his son Joseph. And if you look at it on a map and study it, you'll see that, man, he had to get up and he had to really get to walking fast to get there, to be there by the time that he knew that she would be there. Because she's going to be there at noon... Because she wants to avoid the rest of the people, she's going to be there at the heat of the day because more than likely, she's ashamed of the sin and things that are in her life. So she doesn't want anybody pointing them out to her, pointing fingers at her. She wants to just go about her own business and be kind of fade in the background. I heard something, yeah, this week too that I never thought about about wearing a mask. Just happened to be listening to the radio and this girl called in and said, I wish they would continue to have mask mandates. And I never, this never crossed my mind one bit. She said, when I put on the mask, I don't look as ugly. Man. She wanted just to blend into the world. She didn't want the world pointing fingers at her. Where is Christ's love in that? That someone could feel that way. I don't know if this is how the woman at the well felt. I don't know. But I knew Jesus had to go to her. Verse 6, Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired, was, and, and Jesus, tired as he was from his journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? Now just reading this on the surface, but you've got to realize that all of Jesus' things on the surface are to give you much more spiritual insight. Sounds like he's thirsty and he needs a drink. You don't know that he didn't drink prior to that. And the disciples came by with him. They were with him. And then they went to town to get food. I think if they were parched, they would have got something to drink. Don't know, but putting that into Scripture. So it had nothing to do that he needed a drink from her. It was, are you willing to give to the one who's willing to give you everything? Just something as simple as giving a glass of water to someone who is thirsty. I believe there's other scriptures that will back me up there. I'm not trying to make a one-sided point. It wasn't just so that he could start a conversation because he could have started it anywhere. You have to continue to read through to realize that Jesus would give her living water. Was she willing to give others a drink? The spiritual here. So many people in this world are thirsty including those who already know Jesus Christ, including 
you and I from time to time, and we need someone else to offer us that drink. Even though we have living water, we still seem to thirst at some times. And guess what? Even if you don't come to me when I'm thirsty, I know that the Holy Spirit will continue to spring up into me and to quench my thirst. And it's, He is the only one who will quench my thirst for all eternity. But it sure would be nice to have my arm as the body of Christ working with me and my leg working with me to carry out our mission to be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. It's God's design why we stayed behind so that we could be the church, His hands and feet. Verse 8, His disciples had gone into town to buy food. I already talked about that. The Samaritan woman said to Him, You are a Jew and I am a Samaritan. That's a no-no. How can you ask me for a drink? And I'm just a lowly woman as well. And then it says in Scriptures here, For the Jews did not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her and said, If you knew the gift of God, the gift that you're given, something that you don't deserve, something that God gives you because He loves you, and what father does not want to give his children good gifts, how much more, Jesus said, will your father give you the Holy Spirit? Not to necessarily take that burden from you, but so that you can deal with that burden. So that even when you're laying in prison and you don't have a clue what's going on, you're writing letters to the churches and you say, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. It is well with my soul because I am a child of God. There is nothing that man can do to me. There is nothing that I can fear. No reason for me to be troubled. Jesus answered and said, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, that has humbled himself for you asking, Will you serve me? You would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Verse 11, Sir, the woman said, You have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Now maybe she's just making casual conversation again or maybe she realized that she was coming face to face with God that day, coming face to face with her sins and what she would do with them. I don't know. But she says this in verse 12, Are you greater than our father Jacob? So there was something about Jesus. It wasn't just another guy asking her for a drink or she wouldn't have asked that. He is the one who gave us this well and drank from it himself. I'm looking physical again instead of spiritual. As did also his sons and his livestock. Verse 13, Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. I'm talking about spiritual. And I think the woman understood this with what she said. But whoever drinks the water that I give them, they will never thirst Indeed, the water I give them will become in them. Okay, stop right here. In Allen. Now, you don't have to say it out loud, but say in. Okay, out loud is even better. Is the Spirit springing up wells of living water inside of you? That's what that means, like a fountain. You ever seen the Bellagio fountains where they just dance like that? They're so beautiful. All that just dancing. Maybe you can see a pattern to it. Maybe you can't, but it's just beautiful seeing all that spring up. And that's how the world should see you and I and the church. That we should just be springing up. A spring of water welling up to eternal life. Don't you want this? Don't you want this for your family? <laughs> You gotta, if you can fathom God's love at all, don't you even want it for your enemy? Because we were Christ's enemies when He died for us. But now we're friends. We're brothers and sisters with Jesus because of His sacrificial love for us. Verse 15, The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, go call your husband and come back. Why did he say that? Because more than likely, that might have been her sin, but I'm not going to say that was her sin. That was where her pain was. 
And she wanted that pain and that hurt gone. Because a lot of times we don't realize the sin that we do. We just understand the consequences of those bad decisions. Because we were made to glorify God. Even in chasing after the things that we do and we're successful in this world and we've given to people and everything else, without that relationship with God, we're void. And we will die in our sins. She said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you're right when you say you had no husband. The fact is that you've had five husbands. And the man that you now have is not your husband. What you have, what you have just said is quite true. Verse 19, Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is Jerusalem. A lot of commentaries you'll read here saying she's trying to sidetrack the, the, the subject matter that's here, that she doesn't want to be exposed from her sins. Well, you know, there's truth to that. There's truth to that in every one of our lives. But deep down, you really do want it exposed. Because like I said, you are nothing without God. And you were created in His image. And all these times you keep making excuses, you're not letting God live through you the way you were designed. Even though you sinned, even though you deserve God's wrath, Jesus took it upon His shoulders where you could cry out, Father! and have Him pour out His Spirit on you so that you dance and spring up with joy no matter what the circumstance is and others see that springing from you so that you can give them water. That you can give them your testimony about what Jesus Christ has done for you. Jesus says, Woman, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. It's not about a place. It's about how. It's about a relationship. Learning to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, mind, soul, body, and strength. Right back to the beginning, right back to where Jesus said, what, what is the greatest commandment? And then the second is like the first, to love one another of which he continued to expound upon. You Samaritans worship what you don't know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when true worshipers, true as opposed to fake, false, not, true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. It's not a matter of where, it's a matter of worshiping from the heart. Because you just get a prick of how much God loves you and you can't be quiet about it. And you can't not want to eat of the bread of life and drink the living water so you will never hunger and never thirst again. And it will swell up into you where you can't not give it to others because you love even your enemy. For these are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. We're going to talk more about that. God seeks these kind of worshipers. Verse 24, God is spirit and His worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. The first spirit is talking about our essence and the second spirit here is talking about the Holy Spirit who will guide us into all truth. Verse 25, the woman said, I know the Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the, wo the one speaking to you, I am he. Now I'm stopping there for today. I'm not stopping. I'm stopping there in the scripture for today. Barb chuckled at me. There's so much more to the story there. The missed opportunity of the disciples. Her witness where she did go out and give those springs of living water to others that she could not keep quiet. And those people didn't know her except for what she thought they knew about them, and those thoughts were probably true. They probably thought she was that woman. But it didn't stop her from telling them about Jesus. As you read on, you'll see, could He be the Messiah? And because of her testimony, not the disciples' testimonies, who said, why is He... They're talking to this woman. Many from the town came and believed. 
And then if you read at the end of this chapter, verse 39, many of the Samaritans from town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. That's you and I. How can you stay quiet if the Spirit of God, He, lives inside of you? How can you not be swelling up except that you're focused on too many other things and you're missing your mission? That's why you have to deny everything that you thought before was important and live for the one who is the most important, passionate thing in your life because of how much He loved you. Jacob got me these for Father's Day. And here's a sermon that this gentleman wrote about that. And I'm just going to say a few things from it. It is a spiritual imperative that we have ministering hearts. Having an enlarged heart will equip us to serve others. Jesus overcame his weariness and some difficult social and religious barriers. As discussed in the last chapter, because the Samaritan woman had a parched soul that had never found satisfaction. And our Savior knew that if he did not reach her, her soul would go on searching vainly and bitterly. Her life was a miserable chain of unfulfilling relationships. The pathetic fact that she had married five times indicated that she longed for fulfillment in her life and she had sought it intensely. Our modern minds have no trouble imagining the course that her life has taken. Her first marriage had probably begun with a racing exhilaration that is common to new love. That funny feeling you get instead of that choice to love. Even when the other person doesn't know anything because they've got dementia or whatever and they're, they're cursing you, but you continue to love them. She expected it would carry that through her entire life, but something went wrong and she had been left alone. Then came another man and the fires began to flame again, though not quite as high as before, only to disintegrate into cold ashes. Then came another and another and another. Now she comes to the well at noon so she can avoid the respectable people. She is worn down and despised. There are a few abuses, there are few abuses that have not been hurled at her. About the only thing she left is her quick tongue and her wits. Maybe we see that in, that com in her conversation. Above all, she is filled with a deep longing, a thirst for something better. It is fitting that she comes to the well. She carries a pail so she can draw water to assuage her thirst. The Samaritan woman illustrates the longing of mankind and our thirst for something more fulfilling in life. Ours is an age of thirst. Over the years, I have heard some regular and popular songs that keep repeating this phrase, that these things will satisfy me that this is what life's about. Our Lord addressing the poor woman amazed her, produced in her this question, how is it that you, a Jew, that's first before she asked the Messiah, you, my enemy, you those who point fingers at me worse than even my own people in my own town, how is it you can ask me for a drink? On the surface, it sounded like Jesus was simply saying that if he had known, if she had known who he was and had asked him for a drink, he would have given her clean, sparkling, flowing water. But he's talking about the spiritual, what the Spirit of God can do for you so that you don't ever hunger or thirst again. The Samaritan woman understood that he was a man of God. He could satisfy her longing. From our advantage position, we know that Jesus was talking about the Holy Spirit. Because later in John chapter 7, we will read, If anyone thirsts, and that's why I kindly briefly went over that before, let him come to me and drink. 
Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. What Jesus was saying to the woman was this, nothing will ever satisfy our longings and our dissatisfactions, our hurt, our pain, except for a long and continuous drink of God, the Holy Spirit. Maybe you're saved. Maybe you're not saved. Maybe you are totally being quenched all the time. But I want you to know this, that no matter where you're at in your relationship with God, the Spirit is a never-ending flow of living water for you to live by. It is the power of God that saves you because He loves you so much. It is the power of God that will sanctify you for all eternity where you will be holy and righteous. And it is that process of getting there now that the Holy Spirit will guide you into all truth. That's why I taught about the Holy Spirit being a person. It is nothing wrong with saying the Holy Spirit is Jesus. The Holy Spirit is God. And He has given you new life and He should be living from you to the point where springs of living water are bubbling up inside of you and that others will see that because just as you were hurting and may still be hurting God has a cure for all that his name is Jesus and it is God's will that you be his light his hands and feet to this world until Jesus Christ returns <clears throat> Father in heaven we do thank you and praise you that you would die for us, that you would choose to come and live with us. Oh, Father, pour out your Spirit. That does mean that we have to say, give me this water. That this is what we want. That we want it more than the other things that we think will satisfy. Lord, I pray you strip away the idols, that you change our way of thinking, that you transform us through and through so that we do honor you. That we love you with all of our heart, all of our mind, our soul, and our strength, and that it permeates in our love for one another, even our enemies. Father, thank you for the gift that you have given us of salvation and the gift of the Holy Spirit, the gift of Jesus Christ, that you are faithful and true, that you are love. May we be children of love and light to this world. We thank you and praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen.